James de Bardeleben. By Juan Ignacio Blanco. Background. De Bardeleben was the second of three children. He had a younger brother named Ralph, and a younger sister whose identity is not publicly known. By the time he was an adult, he had grown to stand six feet tall. In 1945, when James was only five years old, his family moved to Austin, Texas. His father, who was serving in the US Navy, was then shipped out to the South Pacific for nine months. In 1949, his family moved to Kentucky for a short while before relocating to Frankfurt, Germany, but after a year, his family moved again. Adult life. In 1956, at the age of 16, it is reported that Michael first physically assaulted his mother. It is unknown what sparked this violent encounter. On September 8th that year, at the age of 16, he purchased two handguns and ammunition with a friend. Later that month, he was arrested and convicted for his first felony, possessing a concealed firearm. This arrest was the first of many that followed, including arrests for sodomy, attempted murder, and kidnapping. In the spring of 1957, he was expelled from Peter Schuyler High School and did not seek to pursue any formal education. In October that year, he enlisted in the US Air Force and was stationed at the Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Only after a year of being in the Air Force, he was court-martialed for disorderly behaviour and was sentenced to spend two months in the base stockade and have his wages forfeited. He later met Charlotte Weber, who was 17 at the time he started courting her. In March of 1960, he impregnated Charlotte and on June 9th, the same year, married her. On December 12th, 1960, he successfully fathered a daughter, Bethine. Afterward, Charlotte became pregnant again with another child, but was forced by Michael to give it up for adoption. In August of 1961, his brother Ralph committed suicide for unknown reasons. Mal passing case. In the early 1980s, Secret Service agents were investigating a string of counterfeiting cases in which a man was determined to be entering a mall with a wad of counterfeit $20 bills, making a small purchase at each store in the mall, and receiving most of the remainder in legitimate cash as change. De Bardeleben was identified as the suspect in these crimes, and a national manhunt ensued. At the time of his arrest, more wads of counterfeit $20 bills were found in his car each with a label stating the city in which it would be used. His counterfeiting operation was also discovered, along with evidence of sex crimes. De Bardleben was convicted of multiple crimes and is currently serving a 375-year sentence at Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. The DSM-4 cites De Bardleben as an example of antisocial personality disorder. James Mitchell, Mike De Bardleben. At the time that the first bill was identified, the Secret Service was not overly concerned about apprehending the forger of the bills. By the end of 1980, however, de Bardeleben had passed over $30,000 worth of notes discovered in 38 states. In 1982, de Bardeleben managed to pass over 130,000 worth of counterfeit bills in 44 states. His counterfeiting was increasing, and he became the top priority of the counterfeit division. Because of his method of passing bills, he was dubbed the mall passer. With the help of store employees in Kentucky, Minnesota, and Colorado, the Secret Service was able to complete a composite sketch of the man known as the mall passer. These individuals described the mall passer as 5 to 9 to 5 to 10, tall and 160 to 170 pounds. In addition, they claimed he had black hair with a receding hairline, wore dark frame eyeglasses, and was approximately 30 to 35 years old. The composite sketch was distributed to Secret Service field officers in Arias where the mall passer was known to have passed his... fake bills. Agents then distributed the sketch to all the malls in the area in an effort to raise the public's awareness regarding the mall passer. While the Secret Service was distributing the sketch to malls, they were also learning more about the modus operandi of the man known as the mall passer. Agents learned from mall employees who had interactions with the mall passer that he was typically well-dressed and ascertained that he employed disguises such as fake beards, moustaches and wigs. 
He also avoided male and older female clerks, seeking out young women and girls who he could distract through conversation while they rang up his low-priced purchases. Apprehending de Bardleben, On May 25th, 1983, the hard work of the Secret Service paid off. De Bardeleben entered a mall in Knoxville, Tennessee, and purchased several small items. Store clerks, who had been alerted earlier by the Secret Service, called Mal Security, who then notified the Secret Service. By the time de Bardeleben realised that he had been identified as the Mal Passer, it was too late him to flee. He was immediately arrested. In custody, de Bardeleben refused to answer any question admit to any crime or discuss any of the counterfeiting charges that were being brought against him. The main objective of the Secret Service at this point was to locate his printing plant. Agents returned to the mall with car keys found on de Bardeleben and a search warrant in hopes of discovering some clue as to where the location of the mall passer's plant was. When the Secret Service agents opened the trunk of de Bardeleben's car, they realised that the man they had apprehended as the mall passer was involved in crimes much more serious than counterfeiting. However, the full extent of these crimes could not even begin to be comprehended until later, when agents in Washington, D.C. located a storage unit de Bardeleben had rented. Hopeful about locating de Bardeleben's printing plant, agents Dennis Foose and Greg Mertz discovered evidence of crime so heinous that thoughts of those crimes would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Among the items located by the Secret Service were homemade audio tapes and photographs of sex slayings and a death kit containing handcuffs, shoelaces, chains, KY jelly, and worse, a woman's bloody underwear. Agent Foos knew that they had uncovered a criminal beyond the usual investigation capabilities of the Secret Service in investigating. He contacted the Federal Bureau of Investigations, hoping for guidance or help in piecing together the evidence and locating the victims. However, because of the nature of the investigation, the FBI was reluctant to help. Investigations typically start with a victim, and investigators work towards finding the offender. In this case, the Secret Service had the offender. Evidence of crimes, but no known victims yet. Agents Foos and Mertz then set up a database on an Apple II computer, similar to VICAP, the database used by the FBI to tie crimes together, and began compiling lists of crimes and victims in the areas de Bardeleben was believed to have been preying. Eventually, the Secret Service agents came up with a list of victim names and crimes that fit the evidence. The victims. The actual number of victims of de Bardeleben's will never be known. Unlike most criminals of his ilk, de Bardeleben refuses to acknowledge guilt or brag about any of his crimes. However, the Secret Service believed that he had been preying on women for 18 years prior to his arrest. Considering that Ted Bundy, whose killing spree lasted only five years and resulted in the deaths of somewhere between 28 to 100 women. The number of women de Bardeleben is believed to have preyed on is staggering. On September 3rd, 1978, in Delaware, de Bardeleben kidnapped Lucy Alexander. He repeatedly raped and sodomized her, forced her to perform fellatio on him, and then released her in an isolated area. On February 4th, 1979, he kidnapped Elizabeth Mason, repeatedly choked her and banged her head on a wall until she lost consciousness, then left her for dead. On June 1st, 1979, de Bardeleben kidnapped Laurie Jensen, took her to his home, and for 24 hours raped and sodomized her, forced her to perform fellatio on him, forced her to masturbate herself using an oversized dildo for him, demanded that she call him daddy and took pictures and audio taped her throughout the entire ordeal. He then released her a few blocks from her home. On November 1st, 1980, once again de Bardeleben found another victim, Diana Overton. However, she managed to fight him off and escape it before he could harm her. After his failure to successfully victimize Overton, on November 12th, 1980, he kidnapped Maria Santini, stripped her and tied her hands and feet, 
took pictures of her in provocative poses, and then dumped her in the woods. On April 27, 1982, de Bardeleben kidnapped real estate agent Jean McFall. Her body was later found in an attic of a new home, lashed to a rafter by a ligature on her throat. She was fully clothed and had two puncture wounds to the heart. In addition to victimising numerous strangers, Secret Service agents were able to piece together de Bardeleben's personal life and discover five wives whom had all suffered similar horrors to the ones suffered by the women he kidnapped. Agents believe that de Bardeleben practised his fantasies on his wives prior to acting them out on the women he kidnapped. De Bardeleben's third wife, when interviewed in court for the cases against de Bardeleben, testified that to him, all women were whores, sluts, tramps. They asked for what they got. Michaud. 1994. However, the object of de Bardeleben's most malicious thoughts and fantasies was his fourth wife, Karen. Among the evidence found by the Secret Service was a detailed description titled Script Scenario, written by de Bardeleben describing conversations he would have with her while torturing her. He wrote, 1. Tell me all about the pain. Necessary? Why? Describe it. Details. More details. How does it feel? I don't know. It's not happening to me. Convince me that you like it. 2. Tell me how you feel humiliated. Degraded. 3. Tell me how you like for me to bite your tits, slap your face, bite you in the ass, make loud surprise noises. 4. Bite or cigar or whip at moment of ejaculation. 5. Hair. Pull as mane. Say, arf, bow wow, nay. 6. Say original statements. Of Karin, de Bardeleben wrote, She never really loved me. And I don't want to kill Karin, I want to punish her. It was apparent to the agents that Karin was the source of de Bardeleben's anger and hatred towards women. The evidence and the charges. <laughs> By the time investigators were done piecing together the evidence against de Bardeleben, he faced 11 indictments, including two for murder, in nine states. Among these indictments were six charges for counterfeiting in various states, sodomy, robbery, and armed criminal action in Missouri, kidnapping charges in Connecticut, and a federal kidnapping charge in Baltimore. Investigators had worked long and hard, applying forensic techniques to tie de Bardeleben to the crimes they believed he had committed. To start with, the Secret Service reprinted copies of the photos from the negatives taken from de Bardeleben's storage unit. It was apparent that de Bardeleben had cut the photographs to remove parts of his body that appeared in them. The agents needed to prove that the male body parts appearing in these photographs were de Bardeleben's. An FBI forensic photographic analyst suggested that de Bardeleben could be tied to the photographs by comparing pictures of distinguishing marks, such as moles and scars, on de Bardeleben's body to distinguishing marks on the man in the photograph. To do this, the agents needed to secure known photographs of de Bardeleben. Under federal court order, de Bardeleben was forced to submit to body photographs. These photographs proved de Bardeleben was the man found in the photographs of the sex slaying that were gathered with the evidence from his storage unit. Next, Agents took handwriting samples to compare to the notes and diaries found in his storage unit. The samples were then sent to a handwriting expert. The handwriting expert based his opinion on the details of particular letters, the height of different letters, and the slant of the writing. These samples were compared to each other by a handwriting expert who determined they were written by the same individual. Last, de Bardeleben was ordered to give head and pubic hair samples. These samples would be compared to the samples taken from his known victims during forensic examinations after they had been victimised. Hair samples are compared under a microscope. Some of the identifying characteristics forensic scientists were looking for are the way in which pigment particles are shaped and distributed, and the precise colour of the hair. Forensic scientists were able to conclude that the hair samples taken from de Bardeleben matched those on some of the victims believed to be his. The Trials De Bardeleben was tried and convicted based upon the forensic evidence, victims' testimony, 
and witnesses' identification in six separate cases for counterfeiting, kidnapping, and assault. He received a total sentencing of 375 years. The other states involved in the indictments of de Badeleben decided to forego lengthy trials, due to the fact that by the time de Badeleben would be eligible for parole, he will be 100 years old. Since de Badeleben was imprisoned, he has spent his time corresponding with other serial killers, such as Ted Bundy, and putting together numerous appeals. He has been moved from prison to prison based on his various complaints, including fear of harm by other inmates. De Badeleben still refuses to acknowledge his crimes and claims that the Secret Service manufactured their evidence against him in an effort to build their case. The Secret Service agents, jury members, judges and investigators involved in this case believe that de Badeleben's crimes are unsurpassed to those of any other known individual. When you work hard to do something right, you don't want to forget it.